It was a brisk fall morning in 490 BC. And there were 11 men standing on a hillside. And this hill was covered with trees. And these men were overlooking a small plain on the eastern coast of Attica. And these 11 men were Athenian generals. And what they were looking at was a number of ships that had just started to touch the shore. And they were offloading their army and their forces and their weapons. And the name of that plane, that little crescent-shaped plane, which wasn't very big, was Marathon. I'm describing the beginnings of the Battle of Marathon because the Battle of Marathon has a touch point of some lessons I want to talk about today. This particular battle, almost every historian will agree, is a turning point in world history. And there are a lot of interesting stories in and around this battle, but the fundamental issue of it being a turning point in history is because the Persian army, which was attacking Greece and the city of Athens in particular, um, was an Asiatic army. It was an Asian culture. And if that army had subdued Greece, then it is highly likely that the development of Europe would have been influenced by an Asian culture. Now, this is easy for us to reflect on for this very reason. Look at the development of Europe in our lifetime, which was influenced heavily by Greece and Rome, two civilizations who cared for freedom and who cared for independence and, and wall that that brought to Europe and consequently over to the United States, and look at what happened with the development of China. There's no doubt in the minds of those who analyze this that had the Persian army won, Europe would have been a far poorer, less free, set of nations than they were in the time that we live. Of course, the 11 generals didn't know that. What they were looking at was in a massive force that was set to destroy their homes. And they were trying to decide whether they wanted to do anything about it immediately or whether they wanted to fall back or how they were going to deal with it. The Persian army was led by a very famous and very successful general whose name was Datus. The ancient sources say that his army was of approximately 100,000 men. 100,000 men. The modern sources contest this and they say, nah, it probably wasn't 100,000 men, it was probably something, and they'll vary. Maybe only 30,000, something like that. And they'll vary on what they think it was. But the point is that the Greek army, almost every historian agrees, was about 10,000 men. And therefore, the difference is what's remarkable. The Greek army was terribly, significantly outnumbered. Three to one odds in a military situation is not good. And so they were trying to decide what they were going to do. It was a close vote, but they voted, of course, to attack. And we know from history that the Greeks won. But What's amazing is that so few can overcome so many. It's unusual. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen sometimes in history, and we're always startled by it because it doesn't seem like the few should be able to do anything. There's no rational reason we can conjure in our minds humanly to say that the math works out. How are 10,000 men going to be able to fight maybe 100,000? How do you possibly attack when you're outnumbered 10 to 1? How is it you run toward an enemy that outnumbers you so drastically? And what were the Persians thinking when they looked at this collection of 10,000 men running at them? I can only imagine they thought they were crazy. You must be crazy. There's 10,000 of you and you're running at us? By the way... The army of Datus had never been defeated, never. A massively bigger army that had never been defeated. And the Greeks lined up, grabbed their swords, and attacked at a dead run and hit that Persian army 
And over blood and bone and bodies, they drove that army back into the sea, back on those ships, and they won the day. One turning point in the history of the world. Well, brothers and sisters, take a look around. We are the few. <laughs> we are the few. We have, therefore, some similarities we want to look at, but we want to look at them not from necessarily a military point of view, because that's not always going to be a parallel. We want to think about them in the eyes and in the mind of God. How does Jesus Christ look at the few? Because that's what he has, and that's actually what he plans for. Okay? Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. The words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 20, verse 16. He says, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. For many are called, but few are chosen. We are supposed to be the few. God favors the few. That's the way God likes to do business. He invests in the few, and he wants them, and he empowers them to overcome the many. There is no greater testimony to this than the very life and teachings of our king and our hero, Jesus Christ. Think with me for a moment. We know that Jesus Christ taught for three and a half years. And for three and a half years, he did countless miracles. The book of John tells us that there weren't enough books to hold all the wonders and the miracles that Jesus Christ did during his ministry. He did all these ministries culminating with the fact that he raised a man from the dead, gave his life for us on the cross, and was resurrected walked around and taught the disciples for several weeks before they watched him ascend into heaven. And after all of that, that amazing life, that amazing ministry, how many people signed up and said, I'm in it, I'm, I'm for you, I'm here? 120. 100. And 20 people were showing up and saying, I'm on board. After three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus likes the few. Jesus will take those odds. That's who Jesus is. That's what he's planning. That's what he likes. He works with the few. He likes the few. He chooses the few. But we're not just the few. We have some other attributes we need to think about today. I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. Let's take a look at this important set of scriptures. In Matthew 11, we begin to read the story of one of the great servants of God. His name was John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was put into prison. He was arrested, and he was thrown into prison. And he began to hear about the works of Jesus Christ, so he sent his disciples out to ask Jesus a couple of questions. And Jesus had high regard for John as, as a servant. He knew that he was a servant of God. He talked in high praise of John in other parts of the Scripture. So he told the disciples of John, I want you to go back to John and tell him what you see and what you hear. And then he begins to tell those disciples Here's what you're going to say. And he basically tells them two things. The first thing is he tells them, tell John that you see the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and basically miracles occur. Okay, The power of God is on display, and so the power of God is what you see and hear. And then he told them to, he told them to tell him one more thing. I want you to read this with me. And he said, tell John the gospel, read it with me, the gospel is preached to the very wealthy. Is that what your Bible says? No? You don't have that translation? Let me try that again. The gospel is preached to the politically co connected. Anybody? No? No, our Bibles don't say that. They, they don't say that at all. They say the gospel is preached to the poor. The gospel was preached to the poor because, brothers and sisters, that's the people who are interested. Now, there's very few of us ever part of this faith who ever had any great wealth because it's very difficult 
to love God and to do the things of this calling and be very wealthy. Maybe if you've been able to do it. But by and large, this gospel is preached to the poor because it is the poor who can listen. It is the poor who can care. It is the poor who won't be distracted. Let's read another section of scriptures. Let's go to Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, this whole chapter is filled with parables, by the way. If you like parables, you're going to love Matthew 25. Always a good thing to read through. There's another parable right behind another parable. As we know, our king taught in parables quite often. But in this particular chapter, beginning in verse 31, we find this famous parable of the sheep and the goats. And the king has returned and he is going to separate the sheep from the goats because he's going to give the kingdom to the sheep. And so he begins to tell the sheep in verse 35 some of the things they've done. He begins to recount for them things he's noticed. He says, I was hungry and you gave me meat, thirsty and you gave me drink, a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me, sick and you visited me, in prison and you came to me. And the sheep say, whoa, oh no, Jesus, we don't remember doing that. When did, when did we ever do that to you? Because if we had done that to you, well, that would, that would really matter. I mean, that would be important. Just think if you could go back in a time machine right now and hand a cup of water to Jesus Christ, we would all just be waiting on pins and needles for you to come back and tell us about handing that cup to Jesus. We'd be thrilled to hear it. Okay, what did he look like? Did you spill it? What, did, what happened? Did he drink it right away? Did he, what, did, what? We'd be excited because it would really matter because it would be Jesus. And that's what the sheep think. But Jesus answers them in verse 40, and he says something very important. He says, if, if you have done it, or if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, we, we want to focus on this word least for a minute, because it's an important word. It's got a lesson in here for us. So I'm going to ask you to do a little, a little thought lab with me. I want you to look around for a moment. I want you to think of who is the least in this room, and I want you to think of that and I want you to hold them in your mind just for a second. Just take a second. Look around. Okay. I notice most of you are looking directly at me. That's fine. <laughs> but notice what Christ says about the least because this is really important. He says, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. You have done it unto me. That means that the least are one with Jesus. Well, who is one with Jesus? Christians are one with Jesus, right? Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what a Christian is. He's someone who has Christ in him. We are the ones who are one with Jesus. We are the least. We're the least. That's what Jesus is teaching us. And the scriptures confirm this. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men are called, and how not many mighty are called, and how not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. And God, it tells us in this verse, has chosen the despised things. And that too, brothers and sisters, is what we are. We are the least. We are the rejected. We are the foolish things and the despised things and the weak things of this world. How many of us here uh, this year got a Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> not this year, okay. So we don't get awards. We're not the praised of the world. We're not the famous. We're not the appreciated. We are the unappreciated. And we are the unappreciated for a reason. Because you can't, it is 
too big a wave to get over. If the world loves you and the world is praising you, the praise of men is an enormous, powerful wave that will wash you out. And God doesn't want us washed out. He's in the business of saving. He's in the business of bringing us life. So he likes the few because that's the way he does business. And he wants those who are considered the least by the world because it's a great insurance policy against a terrible poison. And that poison, brothers and sisters, is arrogance. And we become arrogant so easy. We think we're smart so quickly. We think we know so much. <laughs> and at one point in all our lives, not some of us haven't reached that yet, but there's a point in, in all of our lives, and some of these young people aren't there yet, but there is a point in life where you actually do know everything, and it's when you're 18. You know everything when you were 18. When I was 18, I was for sure, I knew everything. But you lose it after that, okay? But we become arrogant, and arrogant is a poison. Listen to me carefully, and I suggest we all pray for this. Let us pray that we don't become arrogant because you can't. I don't, I believe this with all my heart and I'm not going to go into a lesson on it, but I believe you can't have a relationship with God if you're arrogant. If arrogance enters our hearts and minds and it finds a foothold and it becomes dominant in our behavior, we will ruin our relationship with God. We have to be humble. We can't have a relationship with God unless we're humble. That's why God chooses the least. Because we have all that insurance. And it helps us. Because we have a lot of reasons to be humble. And that's a good thing. Because it means we can be close to God. Because what God is building is something more fantastic than we can truly understand right now. But we have a word that roughly approximates it. We call that word family. Let's turn to 2 Peter. Chapter 1. In Second Peter chapter 1, Peter is talking about us and he, he tells us something really astounding that other scriptures support. We'll look at a couple regarding it. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, Peter says that we have been given, that we who are called have been given what he terms exceedingly great and precious promises. And he says that we will be partakers of of the divine nature, actually partaking of the divine nature. God wants us to have his nature. That's what he wants us to have. That's an astounding revelation. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3, another famous, important apostle who tells us something very similar to this. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1 and 2. First John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because the world did not know Him. So, beloved, now we are the children of God, and it, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. See, we don't fully understand what God has in store for us. We can't even comprehend it. Paul told us that in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But John is telling us here, we do have one clue. When Christ returns, we will be like him. That's what the apostle John is telling us. And just like Peter said, we will be partakers in the divine nature. That's what we'll have. We'll have the divine nature in us. So here we have the scripture telling us there is God the Father, 
There is Jesus Christ the Son, and we are the children. What does that sound like? Sounds like family. And this is a family not in name only, but this is a family that lives the way a family is supposed to live. That's the kind of family we have to be. Okay? It's not just a label. It's not a bumper sticker. Okay? It's not a banner over the feast, although there's nothing wrong with banners that says we are family. Fine, you can have a banner that says we are family, but that ain't going to get it done. Okay? It's got to be more than that. And Jesus Christ told us what it's got to be. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. We, brothers and sisters, we have to begin, we have to continue, we have to make sure that we are loving one another as brothers and sisters Truly in a family. That's the call. That's the call. If we don't love each other like brother and sister, then I submit to you, we're not getting it yet. We're not there yet. So we got to lay down our arrogance. We got to fight that off. We got to put away our hurt feelings. We got to put away our bitterness. We got to put away our anger. And we got to love each other like brothers and sisters. We have to become a true family of faith to do all that God wants us to do or we're not going to get there. And it's not just about love. Love is very powerful and love is very important. But love brings other consequences that are real and we know a lot of them. Let's just touch on one that's really important and all of you know it. Jesus said it himself. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, Jesus is speaking to some people around verse 48. While he's teaching, some folks come in and say, hey, your mom and your brother and your sisters, they're outside. And Jesus takes the occasion to teach us something very important about family. In verse 50, he says, whoever does the will of my father, the same is my mother and my brother, and my sister. Obedience is required to be part of the family. Family is not just some sensitivity training where we are all very careful that no one's feelings are hurt. That's not love. That's not what we're talking about. That's not family. That's not obedience. Family means you got to obey too. You got to obey. You got to love and you got to obey. Jesus Christ obeyed the will of the Father even unto death. And we're supposed to follow Him. We need to obey Christ regardless of the cost. Regardless of who's offended. And we need to love each other like brothers and sisters. And if we do that, then we are family. Then we're approaching what Christ wants us to approach. And we will have the spiritual power of the few of Christ's children. Of God's children. There aren't many of us. There are not supposed to be many of us. Remember Luke 12, 32. Fear not little flock. We aren't supposed to be big. I mean, it's exciting to have, I'm sure, to be in a place, I guess it is, for some people to be in a place where there's a thousand people lined up. When you have a thousand people lined up, how do you know each other? How do, you, how do you love each other like brothers and sisters? I only had three brothers and it was stretching my capacity at the time. Okay? So it's difficult to do that. God loves the few. He loves the least. And He wants us to love each other and He wants us to be obedient. That's what we have to do. Because that's what it is to be in God's kingdom. Let's talk about the kingdom for a minute. The kingdom of God, we are told and we know, is the government of God. And it is the government of God. Let's not forget that. Okay? We talked about the book of Revelation the other day. Our, uh, the man who gave the sermon, um, he told us about the seals. We're familiar that Revelation has 
several dominant themes in it. And there's this scroll with seven seals on it. And uh, many of you will know that the seventh seal is composed of what's called seven trumpets. And that very last trumpet, that seventh trumpet, is the final trump. Okay? It's the final trump when Christ will come back that's spoken of all through the New Testament. In Revelation 11.15, it says that seventh angel will sound. And it says that all the nations will become part of God's kingdom, period. They're going to be in that kingdom. They're, they're going to give up. So the national leaders are going to bow. It's a real government. There's no doubt about it. But it's a completely different kind of government. Let's talk about some of those differences just for a minute. It will have a totally altered, totally different way of judging. A totally different way of judging than our world right now. Let's look at it in Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, it's talking about the king of the kingdom. And it tells us that he will have the spirit of God. And it tells us he will be given the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, of counsel and of might, of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And because of these gifts and this mindset and this spirit, the kingdom of God will judge differently. The next verse tells us, and he will judge with righteousness. He will not judge after the seeing of the eye. He will not judge after the hearing of the ear. But he will judge with righteousness the poor. And he will judge with equity the meek. That's what God does. That's what the kingdom of God does. It's a whole different way of judging. It's not what happens today. This is a judgment based on wisdom and full understanding. God's not going to have limited information. And he's going to know what he's judging. We who are placed in positions that we may have to judge will have the skills and the gifts to do the same. In the kingdom, a different kind of judgment in that government. A different kind of law in that government too. Every kingdom has law, but God's law in the kingdom is going to be different, wholly different than what our law is here in the world right now. Even the best of man-made law. Our law in the kingdom will be very, very different. Let's talk about, there's lots of ways, let's talk about one fundamental way that Jesus discussed. We're going to turn to a very familiar scripture, Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse 36. In Matthew 22 and verse 36, Jesus is asked a question. Someone says, teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus gives him the answer beginning in verse 37, and we all know this answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice the next verse. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What's he talking about? What are the law and the prophets? What does he mean by the law and the prophets? By the Law and the Prophets, brothers and sisters, he is talking about what we refer to as the Old Testament. It's shorthand for the Old Testament. The Jewish people refer to their scripture as uh, three things. The Law, the Writings, and the Prophets. They abbreviate that, if you look in a bookstore, to the Tanakh. Those are the first three letters of the Hebrew words. Torah, Navim, Ketuvi, the Tanakh. Okay? But the Bible, the Old Testament, at the time Jesus taught, the Tanakh was the sum total of all the written words, the revelation of God. So Jesus was saying that everything God has revealed to man, everything God has revealed to man hangs on, imagine a giant hook of love toward God and love toward man. All of God's revelation hangs on that. If you don't have the hook, you don't understand God's revelation. If you don't understand that it's about love toward God and love toward man, you can't perceive the purpose of the law. It is a totally different law. It's not a law built to make profit like we in our world. The government's pass laws so the government can make more money. That's not the purpose of the law. 
The law is upheld by love. That's the purpose of the law. It's a completely different mindset on law. It's also completely different in one other way I want to talk about, and that is leadership. It's completely different in leadership. Jesus talked about leadership, rulership, in Luke 22. In Luke 22, in verse 24, Jesus is just a few hours away, just a very short period of time away from giving his life on the cross. And believe it or not, the 12 apostles get in an argument. And the argument of all things to be arguing about, just a few hours before Christ gives his life on the cross, is they find themselves arguing over who will be the greatest in the kingdom. What we talk about, arrogance. It's out there. It's in the water. If you're swimming in the water, and we all are, it's in the water, brothers and sisters. It's hard not to take a mouthful. Okay? We have to be careful. Even the disciples were arguing about who will be the greatest. And Jesus took the opportunity to teach them some things about leadership. First, he said, you know, the Gentiles who are rulers, they lord it over the people they're supposed to be doing good for. The word benefactor is in your Bible in most translations. They lord it over them. They exercise lordship, your translation may say. But then he tells us, but it shall not be so among you. It shall not be so among you. But he who is greatest, let him be as the younger. And he who rules, he who governs, he who is the chief, let him be as he who serves. Later in that chapter, he says, I'm among you as a teacher and a master, and I serve. Service is the definition of greatness, and service is the definition of leadership. And the leadership in the kingdom will be motivated by service. It will be a completely different kind of leadership and governorship and rulership than we experience now where everyone who is trying to rule can't wait for someone to brag about them and talk about them and how wonderful they are. And when they get up, they can't stop talking about, you know, I'm so wonderful and I'm so smart and aren't I the greatest guy you've ever known? It'll be a completely different kind of government. And all those differences amount to one key thing that we should easily relate to, brothers and sisters, and that's family. Those differences reflect even what a good family in the world should be doing, right? Because a family doesn't judge on limited information. It doesn't judge on the first rumor. A good family doesn't do that. And who knows their children better than a mom? No one knows their children better than a mom. You take your baby to a doctor and the doctor will ask the mom, has he been asking diff has he been acting different? Have you noticed any unusual? How do Why does he ask the mom? He's the professional. Because he doesn't know the baby as well as the mom. No one knows that baby as well as that mother. She knows how it smells and how it moves and how it cries. She knows every sound that comes out of it from any type of thing that might it come out, come out of in the body. She knows all the sounds, everything about that baby. No one knows a child better than its parents if the family's working right. And therefore, when they judge the child, they judge with wisdom, with a spirit of wisdom and understanding if they're doing it right, because they can tell if their child is up to no good. Sometimes they are. And they can also tell if their child was just doing something out of stupidity, which I did a lot of. Okay? Probably both. But a family can tell. Okay? Okay? And a family lays down the law on its kids for a reason. Because mommy and daddy love you. The law is don't run in the street so you won't die. <laughs> well, mommy and daddy would like you to live a little longer. So running out in the street is not a good option. That's why families lay down the law. Okay? That's why they do that. And the rulership in a family, what does the most powerful beings in a family do? When the weakest are sick, when the weakest are hurt, the most powerful beings in the family, mommy and daddy, take care of the weakest. They serve the weakest. And sometimes the weakest are very sick and the little children don't know this, but so are mommy and daddy. But it doesn't matter. They stay up all night with a child who is sick because they serve. Because that's what family does. 
They serve the weakest. The most powerful serve the weakest. Leadership should be service. And if our families are working right, we'll understand that. Leadership is meant to be service. And not all of us know this, but some of our brothers and sisters know this. When a family doesn't have enough food for everyone to eat, you know what the, you know who gets the food? The babies, the children. The parents go without and they give it to the children. That's what happens. That's what leadership is. Okay? So yes, brothers and sisters, we are the few. You bet. We are the few. And yet, we're the despised, but we can call ourselves the children of God. And we are moving toward a kingdom that is a family, a family. And we have to hold on to that and we have to preserve that so our children have that faith. So we can give them that same faith. So this faith does not die from this earth. And we need to pray every day that our families stay together and that we have the strength to be willing to serve. The strength to be willing to love the way we should our families, no matter what the hardship. And we need to pray that we will have the courage to be willing to suffer and to sacrifice so families, our families, can stay together. So we can teach our children not only about family and our families, but by example also point to the family that we're all headed toward. Because we are put in a family to head toward a family. And we are the family of the few. And we are the family of the few that overcome the entire world. God bless you on this Sabbath day, and God bless you in the keeping of it.